On August 29, 2005, Hurricane Katrina, a Category 3 hurricane with recorded wind speeds of 140 miles per hour, devastated communities in Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. And I remember being a teacher in Missouri and hearing reports of families heading north to find refuge all along the Mississippi River. Our school system welcomed families and quickly learned of their very specific needs. The children had been through a great deal of trauma. What I didn't know until now was that after Katrina, in 2014, the New Orleans public schools transitioned from a traditional school district to a 100% charter school district. The superintendent would be hired by a school board and it would be their responsibility to oversee and authorize each charter school, working with each charter school's own school boards. What a task. My guest this week describes that important work. Dr. Avis Williams is the New Orleans superintendent, and she reminds us that when you're bringing people together around an issue, there is a difference between buy-in and commitment. In fact, you'll hear her say, if people can buy in, then they can be bought out. Listen for it. She also describes the creation of a joyful educator collaborative where she convenes teachers to learn more about what's going well, as well as areas for continued growth. It's a great episode. Thanks for tuning in. Today on An Imperfect Leader, Dr. Avis Williams is my guest. And Dr. Williams is the superintendent of schools for the NOLA Public Schools in New Orleans, Louisiana, which I think is funny that I have to say Louisiana because I think it's the only New Orleans that everybody knows, right? You can have a Springfield in almost every state, but New Orleans is New Orleans. (laughs) Prior to historic appointment to lead the NOLA Public Schools, Dr. Williams served as superintendent of the historic Selma City Schools in Selma, Alabama for five years. An award-winning educator, a sought-after speaker, she's a native of Salisbury, North Carolina. And a product of poverty, Dr. Williams dreamed of becoming a teacher from an early age. And as a first-generation four-year college student, she followed the path of her older siblings and joined the Army right after high school. While in the Army, she was stationed in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, Yongsang, Korea, and Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama. And I am certain that segment two's after action review will come naturally to Dr. Williams because the after action review process was developed in the military and is used regularly. Dr. Williams, welcome to an imperfect leader. Well, thank you so much. It is certainly my pleasure to be here. Avis, what an honor to spend some time with you today. You know, I could have spent the entire time listing your current and past leadership roles in various associations or the many accolades you've received. But what really caught my eye was that you are a leader, certainly, a learner, Mm -hmm. and an author. And and I want to talk about the professional book that you have coming out. But before we do that, I want to ask you about Welcome to Chase Shadows. In reading the book, I found real comfort in the characters you created of Jason and Janice and Justin. And it made me wonder this. How much of these experiences are autobiographical? Or or maybe what I'm more interested in knowing is, how much did you draw on these characters when you started your new position in NOLA? I mean, in the chapter, Just Be Yourself, Jason is starting in a new place and having to take deep breaths and break through his discomfort. So I, I wouldn't say it's, it's explicitly autobiographical, but as an author, the characters take on um, a life of their own. Now, Chase Shadows is the neighborhood that I lived in in Huntsville, Alabama. So that's where the name came from. And my younger brother's name is Jason. Uh, <laughs> and there was a character, Bree. My daughter's name is Bree. And so, you know, some of the names and some of the characteristics were based on people that I know. Um, and some of it was loosely based on either my own experiences, um, but more like experiences that I've had with young people, because it's about a group of young people who are friends. Jason has a twin sister, Janice, and they're navigating um, this adolescent space, you know, between dealing with bullies and Stacey and the Mean Girls to um, understanding social media and some of the dangers of it in The Little White Lie. Um, And so a lot of that was drawn from experiences that I have had with with young people. Um, But in terms of my my move to NOLA, um, Um, Definitely, uh, when you think about being in a new space and just being yourself and and connecting with people, um, that chapter did look a lot like my experience here. Um, And I named it Just Be Yourself because too often when we're in a new space or when we're nervous or feeling anxiety, it's easy to think that we have to conform or present ourselves a certain way in order to be accepted. And so that chapter was about being yourself. And I brought my full self into this job, including my own core values into this job. 
You know, it's so interesting that you say that because I have spoken to superintendents around the country and often that advice rings so true. And so in that chapter in particular, right, be yourself as you enter this new space, really be clearer about who you are and what you value, because if you are trying to be some type of chameleon within a community, then you find yourself pretty stuck when it gets to the point where you have to make a firm decision that is rooted in your values, but is seen as foreign to the community as a whole, because they thought, oh, I thought we were moving in this direction, but it's something different. And that's too stressful. Who wants to think about which person am I today? Which Avis am I going to be today? Which Avis hat shall I wear today? And as many hats as we wear as superintendents, there is still, for me, a need to to be my true authentic self, um, regardless of the stakeholders with whom I'm engaging. Right. There's a difference between understanding the perspectives that people are bringing to a problem and recognizing and trying to empathize and also being true to who you are. And and I I imagine this book would be a great book for those who are listening for bibliotherapy within your own schools, because yeah. you always have children who are coming or, or if you're yeah. in an urban district where you have a high mobility rate and children are constantly changing schools, what a great way to welcome someone to say, mm-hmm. you know, you're not alone in how you're feeling. Yeah, and there are reflection questions at the end of each chapter. And I did write it with the idea that it could be used as part of your character curriculum or you know, small group instruction and that type of thing for elementary and upper elementary grades. Awesome. I'll put a link to uh, Welcome to Chase Shadows in the show notes. Yeah. I, I want to follow up, though, with uh, I saw an interview with Axios uh, that you have a professional book for educators coming out. I wonder if would you tell us about that book? Absolutely. So I mentioned my core values earlier. So my core values are equity, excellence, and joy. And um, when I talk about bringing my whole self, it's about making sure that I'm coming into a space where I can embody those core values. The book is about equity. um, And the title is The Anti-Racist Roadmap to Equity. And my co-author, Dr. Bryn Elliott, and I started having these amazing conversations during the pandemic. We would meet for Sunday brunch via Zoom. And eventually we started calling them our equity brunches uh, because we were solving all of the world's problems, um, or at least our community's problems, looking at things through an equity lens. And eventually we said, you know what, we need to write a book. So through our conversations and each of us bringing research to the table, uh, we we landed at really leaning in to looking at uh, systemic change as it relates to equity work. You know, so what does equity look like from an anti-racist standpoint as a teacher? as a principal, as a superintendent? Um, And what does the curriculum look like? And we used a roadmap analogy, which I'm super excited about. And so we've got our landmarks, which are your your basic structures, your your general uh, standards and practices that can be supportive. Um, And then we also have roadblocks. You know, what are some barriers? What are some things that may happen along the way that might trip you up? And how do you overcome those? We had uh, shortcuts. Uh, We think about this as that low hanging fruit. You know, how do we get quick wins, even as, 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 as much as this work really truly is about being consistent and staying the course, there are some things that we can do to get some, some quick short-term wins. And then we, we also have rest stops. You know, how does it, how do we reflect on our work? How do we pour into ourselves to make sure that we're staying whole um, and that we're taking good care of ourselves as we do this work? And the book hits the shelves in December, published by ASCD. And And we're super excited to be able to share that. That is super. I I will tell you, I love that rich metaphor. I already started thinking about the fact that sometimes you're you're on the highway, you're going, you know, 60, 70 miles an hour, and then you you get to a slowdown period because there's construction or there's a detour and you've got to take a frontage road that is, you know, parallel to that main highway that you know kind of forces you to take this mid course correction for a moment before you get back on. (laughs) Oh, what a rich, rich metaphor for the work that we do. And for those who are listening, um, her co-author, uh, Bren, is actually a guest in, uh, she was a guest in, in August. And so she talks about the anti-racist roadmap as well. So what a nice complimentary um, episode to listen to along with yours. So in the leadership model that I use to advise others, there is a dimension called the leader's learning work. And, and that's really like the mind of an organization's work. And inside that dimension is this term, system design and systems thinking. Mm-hmm. Now, I read in AASA's School Administrator magazine how when you were in your previous job in Selma City Schools, that you arrived and found the district was in state intervention. 
Yes. Not many people are applying for jobs where they say, oh, it's going to be a lot of work. Yeah, I, I want that job. Right. Yeah. And, and so and I learned how that under your leadership, uh, the district was it was released from intervention. It's now recognized as the only district in the state to achieve tier two performance excellence under the under the Baldridge framework, which is super impressive. And then and you did this with an intentionality around an attitude that people would need to bring to the work. And I and certainly you've spoken just a moment ago about your values of equity, excellence, and joy. The title of the article is Leading with Joy as a Prerequisite to Better Outcomes. And you did it by bringing forward strong systems that you know you could really engage your community and then it would improve academic and cultural outcomes. Um, yeah. So that was a long way of me getting to a question, which is, would you talk about maybe one process? You know, we're, there's so much that obviously went into that, but mm -hmm. one process that you used to build such an enduring system in Selma City, you know, one way that you brought stakeholders together. Yeah, well, I think the first thing is to understand what stakeholders need. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in getting to a level of belief and commitment. You know, too often I, I think we talk about buy-in. And I heard a speaker say once, if you can buy in, you can be bought out. And so we looked at moving from buy-in to commitment um, and really understanding what people needed in order to be committed to the direction of the district. So I started off by surveying all employees and just learning more about their experience experience. Um, and what I learned was that morale was low. Uh, we had um, lots of spaces where the culture was toxic. Um, there was a lot of fear involved in terms of not feeling safe at work and also um, not feeling heard or a sense of belonging at work. And in order for us to move forward in excellence, I had to build positive relationships to get them to a space to where they could actually feel committed to the work. And I did that by forming a transition team and um, that team consisted of internal as, as well as external stakeholders, including our teachers and students and family members. And, and through that, we established core values for the district, as well as developed a strategic plan that, that set us on a pathway to excellence. But the bottom line was understanding what people needed to get from buy-in to commitment so that, that we could embody our theme. And our theme was one team, one voice, committed to excellence. And, you know, we would say that at every convening and I'd see it posted on walls and I would hear people talking about it in real time. And then also talking about our core values as a district. And surprisingly enough, equity, excellence, and joy were part of it. Along I'm shocked. With, right? <laughs> along with students first, teamwork and integrity. Um, so those were our core values and I embodied those values and personified those core values uh, to show my commitment. And so the bottom line was it, it was about making sure that there was clarity around direction as I was building relationships and making sure that people truly felt heard, had a sense of belonging and inclusion, uh, because there's nothing worse than being in a position and you feel like the leadership is doing something to you rather than for you and with you. I continue to be astounded by the thought that that leaders would think that it would be appropriate just to tell people what to do, right? Oh, I believe in shared leadership. I'll tell you what to do. And then you share it with others is just, right. like, it's <laughs> so a, confusing to me. Thing, right? That's not a thing. Exactly. <laughs> and so what I hear you saying is, look, whether it was in Selma City, or then as I transitioned over to NOLA, that it was about including the people most impacted by those decisions Absolutely. inside the system and outside the system, Absolutely. internally, externally. What was, was it a a world cafe? Was it through surveys? Was it one-on-one -on -one conversations? Was it open, you know, op office hours? Was it town hall meetings? How, what was just that one process that you saw that you started to see that shift where, oh, she's serious. These aren't just values that she's written down. These are, she's going to really lead this way. Yeah, I think people actually saw me addressing the concerns that they put in the survey. And I've, I actually reached out to individuals and had conversations with them. I built relationships. I listened. And so I really do think that the school visits that I made with an intentionality behind connecting with my teachers, um, as well as with the students and the leaders. And, you know, one of my directors at the time had um, a mantra that he lived by that I also adopted that said there are two jobs in education. There are teachers and there are those who support teachers. My teachers knew that I needed them. It wasn't just a, a thing where I would pull them together to check it off. Um, I ab absolutely could not have done the work uh, without their commitment to excellence. And so I just did it by um, really being authentic in terms of the relationship building and the listening that took place.
So that's interesting in terms of the work that you did in Selma. Now you have shifted to another community, probably some similarities, certainly some differences. Right. How has your approach changed in NOLA? Well, it wasn't so much a change. Um, I did have to scale it because um, obviously New Orleans is larger than Selma, uh, but I still started off with a transition team, still started off knowing that we needed to build um, a strategic plan. And so we're reimagining a previous strategic plan um, that was not implemented and looking forward to launching that this fall. Um, but I would say one of the biggest things that that I learned in Selma was the, the to value my teachers. And so I'm excited to start the Joyful Educator Collaborative this fall fall, which will be monthly convenings for our teachers. Um, and the whole purpose is to give them a space so that they can create a sense of community and a sense of belonging and to know how much we uh, appreciate and value them. Um, we've gotten commitments from leaders across the city to ensure that they're pouring in. Um, Larry Nance Jr. with the Pelicans is sponsoring the convenings and uh, really excited about his commitment to our school district. And so just really want to make Make sure uh, continuing what I learned in Selma that valuing teachers is 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 has to be a priority. It has to be. I love it. What uh, last week I had a conversation with Dr. Joe Johnson from the National Center for Urban School Transformation, and that's exactly what he said. If you are not engaging authentically and genuinely with your teachers then whatever effort it is that you're trying to do just falls into the reform column. And when you are really interested in transformation, when you include your teachers in those decisions, then you really get to these cycles of inquiry and seeing things as possible and being willing to shift to make those mid-course corrections and change your mind on certain things based on, on their feedback. Yeah, that's really cool. How does the term an imperfect leader resonate with you? Well, I think at the end of the day, none of us are perfect. And I think we have to own the fact that we can make mistakes, that we do make mistakes. Um, and I think for me, understanding that the word leader is where you own it. Because if you are a leader, you have to be willing to apologize, be willing to take a step back, to be willing to say I was wrong. Um, and be willing to just understand that none of us are perfect. And as much as you hold yourself to a high standard, that doesn't mean that you're perfect. And that's something that I had to be real clear about. Excellence is not about perfection. It's about making sure that we're, we're absolutely doing our very best as it relates to the work that we're doing, knowing that we're stronger together and also knowing that we may make mistakes because we're not perfect. And we'll be right back. An Imperfect Leader is underwritten in part by the Water Center for Systems Thinking. Founded by Jim and Faith Waters, the Water Center for Systems Thinking is an organization dedicated to helping individuals and institutions design systems to help them make more thoughtful decisions. Check out the Water Center for Systems Thinking at their website, watercenterst.org. We're back for segment two of an imperfect leader called Imperfect Leadership in After Action. And my guest is Dr. Avis Williams, superintendent of the NOLA Public Schools in New Orleans. And in this segment, we ask our guests to deconstruct the decision that they've made, and then we discuss it. So Avis, what happened? Yeah, so I, I love this question, first of all, because I do think it's important that leaders reflect on uh, the celebrations that we have, but also be willing to share uh, missteps along the way. And so New Orleans is 100% charter schools. And one of the, the primary jobs that I have is to be the authorizer of the charter schools. And what that means is when it's time for charter schools to renew, we have decisions that we have to make. And we have um, a number of metrics that we we use around academics, operations, and finance. And, and it's a really thorough process. And so the mistake that I made was making a decision with the expectation that others who were also leaders would, would share my decision and would be able to clarify the why, the what, and the steps that were made. That didn't happen. And I take full ownership for the amount of, um, I guess, disappointment and confusion that a lot of our families had um, in terms of wondering, how did this happen to us? You know, what? why did we not know about this? Because the reality of the situation is, as the leader, I should have been more proactive in um, informing families, not just the school leaders and the people at the school that did not get a contract renewal, but, but actually connecting with families. Because as I said, 
before, you know, really understanding that we want to make sure that the people who are most impacted um, are, are um, at the table and, and have an opportunity to voice their concerns and, um, and, and be able to get a clear understanding of why decisions are being made. And I've been on both sides of school closure. So I absolutely understand how stressful it can be and how traumatic it can be. I do want to, for those who are listening, uh, they may say, wait, wait a second, 100% charter schools. And so, you know, this is post Katrina decisions, right? And uh, at least the way I understood it. And I wonder if you could just take one quick step back and just kind of explain that scenario or that context for the for the nation. Yeah, and, and charter schools did exist before Hurricane Katrina, um, but in, in the aftermath of the hurricane, all schools were closed um, simply because of the damage. And, you know, there's a lot of healing that's still being done as it relates to Hurricane Katrina, um, and even a lot of healing as it relates to the school system that we currently have, because let's be really clear that this is not a model that everybody loves. And some people feel as though it was done to them rather than um, them having a seat at the table because it did happen during the aftermath of, of Hurricane Katrina, where, you know, gradually the schools were um, chartered and, and, you know, and, and that the goal was to improve them. And, you know, we've got some bright spots, but we also have a lot of work to do as it relates to just making sure that we're improving outcomes for our scholars and um, our accountability framework. That's a driver for me to make decisions about contracts and, and, and decisions about compliance issues around accountability. And so we do have um, over 70 schools, um, about 43,000 students, and uh, we've got some single site charters and then we've got some networks. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I really try to play, pay close attention to is our single sites and making sure that they're supported um, because they do have some challenges that some of the networks may not have just because of the resources that they have access to. And so in prepping for um, the renewal cycle last year, um, again, I, I did not not do as much as I should have around engaging families of the schools that were involved in the renewal cycle. Right. So you become a leader of a very large district with a very big reputation nationwide, lots of eyes on it. And, and that doesn't probably bother you as much as or doesn't even enter your mind because really you're there for children. And yes. what you recognize is, at least the way I understand as you're describing this, is that status quo is not always acceptable. I mean, it I... is it is something that is convenient for many, but you're yeah. looking at the the results and the um, what you would like to see for children. And yes. what I sense is, is that you have families who send their children to school, their children like their teachers and they feel safe at school and, and they come home and they talk about their day, but they don't know the what's happening is that children may not be achieving as they are capable of, right? That we yes. aren't really, they're not reaching their potential. And as a team and as a, and as a leader, you have to make some really difficult decisions about whether or not you're going to renew the contract, which is really a promise with families that their kids are going to thrive in those schools. Absolutely. And so, okay. So, so you, you've made a decision about a contract and that has consequences for families because they now have to find other schools to either apply to or to go to. So yeah. I, it seems to me uh, that may have been one area that was overlooked or what would you say was sort of an area that was overlooked as we now go through these questions? We know what happened, but what got overlooked? So what got overlooked for me was the community engagement, the family engagement, and them hearing directly from me in terms of what could happen before it happened. Um, you know, when I when I talk about the engagement, I'm not talking about after the decision was made. I'm talking about before. Um, if I had it to do all over again, I would have had community meetings at the schools that were up for renewal, and especially those that we had some specific concerns about whether they would be renewed or not. Um, I would have had a community meeting at those schools and, and giving families an opportunity to hear directly from me what the decision-making process, what are the data points that I'm using, uh, what will be the next steps you know, if your school is closed, including the fact that, that your, your child or children would then get what we call closing school priority. Because our goal, if we close a school, the goal is that our scholars are going to better schools, you know, because otherwise, why, why put families through that? And so um, I would have talked to them about that process and made sure that they were armed with all the information that they needed. 
Yeah, because in in your absence, potentially other narratives are are yeah. are, are are spun, and other especially being new. Keep it in mind, right. this was done with me being six months into a, a Ooh, job. Yeah, so hard. Oh, yeah, my. and so that was that was part of the p- piece too that um, you know came back and and I had caught backlash because it was being framed as if this was this was done poorly because I'm new and, 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 you know, didn't understand the district or didn't understand, you know, concepts around the the process for renewal, whatever the case may be. But to your point, you know, people can create their own narrative where we're not really intentional about sharing our narrative and sharing our why in the first place. What did you learn about relationships or what new relationships were formed as a result of this process? Well, I think uh, for me, it was it was really learning more about what the parent experience is like here versus in other constructs where I've worked and other school districts where I've worked, you know, because there is a difference when you're in a space where you've got your charter school and that charter school has a board, um, but then you also have a superintendent and a district that has a board and just understanding the different contexts that that is and what the communication needs to look like in order to engage families. I would say I knocked it out the park overall in terms of community engagement, um, but I missed the mark for this particular um, situation. And so, you know, knowing that absolutely um, see some things that I could have done differently. I think it did help strengthen some relationships with our partners who help with this work. Um, We've got New Schools of New Orleans that does a lot of partnerships with us. And so, you know, working closely with them in terms of planning engagement, because we're at the renewal season again now, and the whole process is, is starting over again this fall. What frustrated you? I think what frustrated me most is the false narratives that were out there about why and about what what I believe. You know, I was being framed as a as a reformer, and I'm using air quotes because it was being used in a really negative way. And I, you know, people accused me of being bought and paid for and that type of thing. Um, and it was really frustrating for for people not to know more about how this decision was af- actually made because I followed all of the rules. And this is the, the the thing about being an imperfect leader: you can do everything right and still have a misstep as it relates to your leadership because I did everything right. You know, there's nobody that could have looked at a policy, a procedure, a contractual agreement or anything else and say, well, you didn't do this because I did everything right. I just didn't do it well. (laughs) And it's, it's so heartening, though, for someone who is known nationally that you're willing to also lead vulnerably. Right. To say I in the sense that I will be vulnerable in accepting where I could have done things better. And I think that certainly speaks to to one's uh, leadership capacity. What could you have done differently? So, you know, I asked the what got overlooked and it, and it, and so that there's sometimes a difference. Sometimes it's system wide. And then there's sometimes that it's sort of a personal decision about what you could have done differently. Yeah. So what I could have done differently is had had um, more clarity on the front end of the decision making process. And that's something that we're doing this year. So we already have identified dates to do community meetings so that all of the schools that are um, up for renewal and and particularly those that are in the comprehensive evaluation process, meaning that you've got to go through some additional steps before we determine whether your contract will be renewed outright or renewed with continuity. Contingencies. So we're going to have community meetings where I'm going to be able to speak to the process of what could happen, you know, the various scenarios that could happen. I'm going to be able to speak to the data points that we use to make the decisions and the timelines so families know exactly what to expect. Another piece, too, is um, my accountability team has meetings with the school leaders as well as their board chairs. And this year I'm participating in those meetings. And that's another thing I could have done differently is been uh, more involved in the the front facing part of the process rather than just the decision maker. I don't want to be the Wizard of Oz, you know, behind the curtain. (laughs) Right. Well, it gives you the opportunity to really engage to say, I want you to be successful. Exactly. Yeah. And so I'm here to be every part of your success. 
Absolutely. As opposed to just being the deciding factor. That Absolutely. You're not because be we're, ready. we're in the process yeah. of, you know, we have a five-year portfolio plan where we're looking at how do we make our, our schools more robust, make our portfolio of schools more robust. And one thing that I've said over and over again is we cannot close our way to better quality schools. Um, and I mean that, and I'm committed to, to working with our school leaders and their boards and our families and community leaders um, to make sure that we're doing all we can for our schools to be successful. In the end, what was something that was good that came out of the experience? Well, I think in the end, um, just from for me personally, it was learning um, some of the the the, the hidden culture <laughs> um, within within our our ecosystem of our school system, and that was good uh, because you know sometimes you know things can can stay as an undercurrent for a very long time, and it, it's happening, and you don't know it's happening, whatever the, it is. Um, but this was was um, an opportunity for me to get more of a bird's eye view of some of of um, the the pieces within our ecosystem that I might not have experienced otherwise, because I could have gone through that process and this not happened. If that school had not been um, closed, if I had not made that decision, then the whole process would have looked totally different. And there are things that I would not have learned that I can now employ as I move through that process for this upcoming school year. Yeah, it sounds like you really unearthed to some extent the mental models that individuals might have been using or community leaders yeah. were using as a way to sort of um, create their narrative about whether yeah. a school was being successful or not, regardless of the fact that you had these documents to say, well, here are all the benchmarks and we don't seem to be meeting them. So yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah. What advice would you give to an aspiring leader? So one thing that I always say is it's not lonely at the top. If you are lonely at the top, that is your choice. Um, and what I mean by that is find your tribe. You know, um, uh, we know that there are about 70% of, of superintendents, I'm sorry, 70% of teachers are women. Um, when you get to the superintendent level, that number decreases um, significantly, and only 1.4% of our nation's superintendents are Black women. And I'm committed to making sure that I'm connecting with uh, all of my sister soups, um, and uh, we've got an, a WhatsApp group that we formed, and I've connected with over 80 Black female superintendents, and we support each other. Um, and even, even before we started doing the larger connection, I I had colleagues, trusted colleagues and mentors um, that I trusted to, um, to give me advice or just to be a sounding board. And then I do that for other people. You know, you know, we have to pay it forward and continue to pay it forward by doing that for other people. This job is, is amazing. And if you're lonely, then you're not doing it right. Um, and, and there are things that you need to really take a closer look at in terms of how you engage with your colleagues and, and how you make yourself available as a mentor for others. My guest again today was Dr. Avis Williams, superintendent of the NOLA Public Schools in New Orleans. And Avis, I got to tell you, what a joy. In fact, my Hebrew name is Simcha, which means joy. So it is, when I read your article, I went, oh, <laughs> it was Simcha, you know. Nice. But what a joy to have spent time with you to learn more about equity, excellence, joy. These are clearly not just words, but the way they are, they are the, every fiber of your being. And the fact that I take away today about including people who are most impacted by decisions, being present and being thoughtful about the decisions that we make. And I love this idea of a joyful education collaborative um, that really will bring people together and they will continue to see you and respect you and just be so pleased and grateful to have you as their leader. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Music for an Imperfect Leader was written and arranged by Ian Varley. Sam Falbo created the Daruma Doll Butterfly artwork. Imperfect Leadership is not a scarlet letter. It is a badge of honor. It recognizes that serving as a lead learner is about being a vulnerable leader, an empathetic leader, a compassionate leader. And I'm proud to be an imperfect leader, so I hope you'll join me next time for another episode of An Imperfect Leader, Leadership in After Action. <laughs>